of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling zero, ceiling zero. Speed Gibson, his uncle, Clint Barlow, and Barney Dunlap, all members of the International Secret Police, are flying to Hong Kong on the China Clipper to capture the criminal known as the Octopus. Thus far on the trip, Speed has been responsible for the arrest of three Octopus spies sent to turn the Secret Police from their course. The last arrest on Wake Island was a renegade aviator who mysteriously disappeared just as he was about to reveal the Octopus hideout to the boys. They have his special bullet plane, however, equipped with all the latest aeronautical improvements, and Clint orders Barney to fly this plane to Hong Kong, making the usual stops at Guam, Manila, and Macau, and to also remain in sight of the clipper. As they are nearing Guam Island, Barney's plane suddenly goes into a nosedive, disappearing in the clouds banked below. The flight crew are as excited as the boys, and when the clipper lands at Guam, they all hurry ashore to see if the Guam ground crew has seen or heard anything of the missing aviator. Gee, Clint, I sure hope that they have heard something from Barney. Well, they may have seen him come down and sent a boat out to help us. Oh, it was terrible to watch him drop into the clouds like he did. The sky was so empty. And those clouds he went into were so black, Marcia. I'm scared for Barney. Oh, don't you worry, Jean, honey. He's probably safe and sound somewhere. He's gotta be. Barney can't go out like that. He's too good a guy to... Clint, do you see who I see? Why, why it can't be. But it is. It's Barney. Oh, Barney, you're all right. Did it fall into the ocean? Oh, we were so worried about Hello, you. Hello, everybody. What's all the excitement about? What's all the excitement? Oh, that's a fine thing to say after scaring everybody out of a year's growth by going into that nosedive. You all were scared. How did you think Barney. I felt up there coming down fast? <laughs> it's hard to say which is the worst, Mr. Barney? Dunlap, sitting in the control yeah. clipper room, watching you dive out of sight or doing the actual diving. As long as you're safe now, that's all that matters. Thanks, Smith. I kept hearing your signals come in, but I couldn't take time to answer them. I know if I didn't pull that plane out of the dive, I'd have a long swim ahead of me. Mr. Smith and the rest of the flight crew were swell, Barney. We were just going to see if the ground crew knew anything about you when you came up to us. <laughs> the ground crew knows about me all right. When I came diving out of that broken overcast, they saw me and thought I was a goner sure. But what actually happened, Barney? Hey, let's get out of this crowd and I'll tell you. Yes. Uh, see you later, Smith. Oh, you bet, Mr. Barlow. Over here on the other side, the dock's all right, huh, Clint? And look, there's Barney's plane. Yeah, and just let me get my hands on the octopus. I'll knock him so far it'll take him two years to walk back. Well, instead of telling us what you're going to do to the octopus, suppose you tell us what he did to you to send you into that spin. The big devil fish? He has some sort of radio control of that plane, and just about the time he knew I'd be in the air, he pressed a button. A metal pin dropped into the controls, and I was off in a nosedive. Imagine taking advantage of me while I was in a cloud bank. Well, what'd you do then, Barney? By the time I realized what had happened, I was in the clouds with visibility zero. Then you sent your idea over the radio telegraph, so I fumbled around until I located the pin, pulled it out, and straightened out the ship for a landing. <laughs> And boy, when I did that, I was as close as I could be to the water and still level out for a decent landing. Well, why didn't you radio the clipper that you were safe? I, I just sat down a few minutes before you came down, Clint. And I was identifying myself to the ground crew after that. While I was nosediving, believe you me, I didn't have any time to work the radio telegraph. I was about the busiest person in the air in the world, I bet. You'll have to give that plane a real going over before you take off again in the morning, Barney. No telling what else the octopus has under radio control. You tell him, kid. I don't want a wing to fall off between here and Manila. Well, right now, we'd better go on to the inn and see where our rooms are going to be. <laughs> I think you and Jean could use a little rest and quiet, don't you, Marsha? Oh, we're not at all tired, Clint. We were worried about Barney, of course, but now that he's safe, why, we're going to enjoy ourselves. Guam is beautiful. I should say so. Just like the islands you read about in books. 
Has this place here a name? It looks like a little town. Its name is Sue May, Jean. One of the navigators was telling me about it before we landed. There's another place that's gone on you about 12 miles from here. That's where the American naval base is. I'd sure like to see that, Clint. Oh, I would, too. Do you think we could arrange to drive over there before dark? Mm, well, if you really feel up to it... How about you, Barney? I'm raring to go, pal. You know me. A nosedive a day keeps me from getting bored. Oh, goody, then we can go. <laughs> well, it looks that way. Now, let's go to the inn now and see about our rooms, huh? And I'll see about getting a car to drive us over to a gun yet at the same time. Hot ziggity. This is what I really call traveling. Listen, kid. What you call traveling, it'd be a nervous breakdown for anybody else. But don't get me wrong. After flying over the Pacific Ocean in a plane with a controls lock, I'd like to see as much of Guam and dry land as I can. Look at those funny grass houses standing on top of those silk feet. Uh huh. Native huts. You know. Guam is so different from almost every place else. Here a person can find the real peace and beauty of island life. And yet, even way out here, they have electricity, paved roads, schools, movies, ice, everything. Yep. A guy born in Guam has everything but United States citizenship. Now, that's a funny thing. He owes allegiance to America, but he can never become an, a citizen. When is an American citizen not an American citizen? When he's born in Guam. <laughs> See, I'm glad I was born in America then. The other's almost like being a man without a country. Oh, no, Speed. Guam is a naval base now, as you know. Every man here, aside from the Clipper ground crew, is a naval man with an official job, from the governor to the street sweeper. The people here are citizens of Guam, but since Guam is not a country, but a part of the United States, none of them, courts or Congress, has any real legal standing since the governor, who is all-powerful here, could do away with one or all of them if he wanted to. Sounds awfully mixed up to me, Clint. <laughs> well, it's mixed up to most people, Jean. I'd advise you to admire the island itself and not try to fathom its political standing. Weren't we rather lucky to get a car, Clint? Mm, in a way. There are only a few on the island, but the Clipper people do everything possible to make their passengers happy. And hence, the car. Hey, Speed, what are you looking so glum about? I wasn't looking glum. I was thinking. Oh, so that's what you call it. Kind of unusual, ain't it? <laughs> I hope not, Barney. Say, do you think that the native driving this car isn't an American citizen? <laughs> well, in spite of the fact that your question met itself coming back speed, he isn't. And I was thinking something else, too. Barney, has the octopus plane got a direction finder on it? Yeah. What's a direction finder, Speed? Oh, it's a jigger shaped something like a little hoop, Gene. It's attached to a dial on the instrument board. When the pilot's getting a message from the ground or from another ship, he can turn his direction finder and learn which direction the message is coming from. Is that right, Clint? Uh, well, it's right enough for the moment. Now, look. Next time the octopus gives out with another warning, why can't we use his own direction finder on him and learn just where his hideout is from that? But is such a thing possible? Oh, yes, Marsha. But several things must be done before a location can be accurately found. Now, for one thing, we need two direction finders. One from Barney's ship, and then one from another point, say a ship a hundred or two hundred miles away from us. And then when the message came through, they could both line the direction from where it came. And where the lines crossed, there would be the octopus. That sounds simple enough. Ain't as simple as it sounds, though. We're still too far away from Hong Kong to be able to locate the exact spot of his hideout. Once we get to China, though, it'll be a different story. Providing he starts broadcasting again. Gee, I bet he won't. Well, I can almost guarantee that he won't. This man's a genius, Marsha. We happen to know that he's experimenting in shortwave radio. He has accomplished some astounding things, so knowing about the direction finders, he certainly wouldn't risk broadcasting to us once we're near enough China to check his station. But there must be some way of feeding him at his own game, Clint. There is a way, Marsha. We don't know what it is yet, but, but that's why we're going to Hong Kong. Every criminal, no matter how clever he is, makes one mistake. If the octopus hasn't made his yet, he will. And that's how we're going to catch him. Mm, this is a spooky place, isn't it? The trees hang way over the road in through here. Yeah, I could find more cheerful spots on Guam myself than this. And I just land. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, oh, wow, here's a blowout. 
We have to fly almost 6,500 miles to have a tire blow up. Sorry, Mr. Barlow. I will repair the tire immediately. All right, driver. I hope it won't hold us up too long. Oh, not at all. I have a spare tire which will replace the bad one. I wonder if I can help him. Well, you better not speed. Probably change tires in this car so often that he can do it a lot faster alone. Well, what do you say if we get out and stretch our legs? This car may be a seven-passenger, but it still cramps my stride. <laughs> Especially as we all rode in back, huh, Barney? <laughs> well, we can get out for a few minutes if you wait. And I advise you all to stay beside the car. It'd be easy to lose yourselves in this thick underbrush. Too easy. I must confess I don't like this particular spot, Do you think it's safe? Oh, yes. We can't be very far from the naval base. There's no danger of hold-ups or anything like that on this island. Unless the octopus got ideas. Oh, now pipe down, Barney. He's up to enough mischief without you building up trouble with your imagination. But even the birds aren't making as much noise, Barney. They sound like they don't like this place either. Oh, they're just getting ready for bed, Gene. These trees and bushes shut out the sun. Hey, behind you! Oh! Oh, that man appeared so suddenly. He frightened me. None of you make a move. Rick's sound. unless you answer my question. Well, who are you to talk like this? Call me Mr. X. And now, Miss Winfield, hand over that map your brother sent you. The map? Hey, how do you know anything about a map? Who are you, anyhow? I ask the question, Speed Gibson. Give me that map, Miss Winfield. But I haven't got it. Don't lie. You carry it in that locket you're wearing. Uh, keep away you. Words are no match for my revolver, Barlow. A locket before I lose my patience. It's true. I haven't got the map with me. Keep away from me. No, no. Gunner, no gun. Let me at that time. Oh, my God. <laughs> 